Good morning, everyone. Ms. Mr. David Schneer, Deputy Chief of Mission U.S. Embassy Barbados and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Lieutenant, the Most Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, Minister of Health and Wellness Barbados. The Honorable Terence Del Singh, Minister of Health, Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Nicholas Steele, Minister of Health and Social Security, Grenada. The Honorable Mos Moses John Baptiste, Minister of Health and Wellness and Elderly Affairs, St. Lucia. Dr. Aloy Kamaragi, UNICEF Representative for the Eastern Caribbean Area Office. Mr. Didier Trebuk, UN Resident Coordinator, Barbados and the OECS. Ms. Marina Walters, UN Resident Coordinator for Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Carlene Raditz, Head of Human and Social Development Unit, OECS Commission. Permanent Secretaries and Staff from the Ministries of Health in Barbados, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia and Grenada. Chief Medical Officers from the Ministries of Health from Barbados, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia and Grenada. Mr. Peter Wickham, UN colleagues, specially invited guests, members of the media, good morning. My name is Lisa McLean Trotman. I'm the Communication for Development Specialist at UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. And it gives me great pleasure to be your chairperson this morning as we launch the findings of the recently conducted vaccine hesitancy survey in the countries of Barbados, Grenada, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Trinidad and Tobago. Last year, countries of this region would have received COVID-19 vaccines from various sources. Indeed, while there was minimal issues with vaccines availability, many countries experienced vaccine hesitancy or low uptake for COVID-19 vaccine. While the situation has improved in some countries, it is still an issue. Several countries did their own studies to understand the nature of this issue. For example, Barbados and Grenada would have done surveys early in the period. St. Vincent and the Grenadines also did survey among its health care professionals. However, recognizing that the issue of vaccine hesitancy is not a static process, but dynamic in that the drivers of vaccine hesitancy three months ago may not be the same as this um, time around. UNICEF, with funding from USAID, commissioned cadres to conduct a study among the general Recording in progress. To understand, the, to understand the issue as it is with vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy in more recent times. The idea is that the findings of this study will be used to influence countries' strategies and their interventions as they address vaccine hesitancy. This study is one of the several activities in the joint UN proposal developed by the UN system of how they intend to support countries in the region. And last November, the study, the work plan of, the, of our proposal would have been presented by the UN resident coordinator for Barbados in November. And this morning, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the UN Resident Coordinator for Barbados and the OECS, Mr. Didier Trebuk, to provide remarks on behalf of the UN system. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good morning. I want to acknowledge the, recognize the presence of most honorable Jeffrey Bostic, Minister of Health and Wellness from Barbados, the honorable Terence uh, Dayal Singh, Minister of Health from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the Honorable Nicholas Steele, Minister of Health and Social Security in Grenada. Uh, Honorable uh, Morse Baptiste, uh, Minister of Health in St. Lucia. Uh, Mr. Uh, David Schneier, Deputy Head of Mission of the US Embassy in Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. Uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Alois Kamulagie, UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean area. Uh, Marina Walter, Resident Coordinator for uh, Trade and Tobago. Uh, Serena Aruba Caruso and St. Martin, uh, permanent secretaries and staff from various ministries of health in the region, chief medical officers, uh, our partner, Mr. Peter Wickham, director of CADRES, UN colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want really to extend a, an extremely warm welcome to you all for your presence to, uh, today. I'm so pleased you've been able to join us and see many of the participants that were actually with us in November when we launched the joint UN proposal to support 
uh, Eastern Caribbean countries in overcoming vaccine hesitancy with the support of the US government and the Canadian government. And today we'll share the findings of this, uh, what I would qualify a groundbreaking study commissioned by UNICEF to Cadres, uh, which uh, deepened our understanding of the vexed and difficult question of COVID vaccine hesitancy in this region. And I want to commend UNICEF for taking the lead on this and uh, also similarly to thank uh, the US government for the financial support and the ongoing very fruitful partnerships. If we were to find a way, I think, out of this pandemic and if we were to resume everyday life uh, with all of the activity and interaction and texture, vaccination is clearly the best answer. And we have indeed seen an increasing number of vaccines coming on stream in the region since 2021, with some countries now starting to achieve widespread vaccination coverage. For example, Barbados has over 60% of the eligible population fully vaccinated. Hundreds of thousands of people in the region have taken the job, but we know that this is not enough, uh, especially in the wake of a, of a new wave with the Omicron variant and perhaps more to come, we don't know. So we seem to have reached a sort of plateau in vaccination uptake and must find new ways to reach those who have decided that the vaccines are not, not just for them. Too many people are still avoiding it. We need to better know why, so we can chart a meaningful way forward to stem an, epi an epidemic which is evolving and creating new variants of concern from different parts of the world, such as Delta and Omicron very recently. And I want today to caution that the fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goal, the goal is at risk of slipping from our grasp. If we don't get to regain control or gain control, I must say, over this pandemic, we may well be looking at a lost uh, decade or years of development. Worldwide, in the sub-region too, we have seen a dramatic rise in public debts of government trying to find a path out of the pandemic for some countries like Barbados and Vincent the Grenadine, Dominican, many others, debt to GDP level have exceeded 100% of national income. We know that this is unsustainable because it forces government to choose between servicing their people or servicing the debt. We have also witnessed the pandemic that the pandemic exacerbates inequalities, for example, in the sphere of education, with children having lost 200 days in school. Uh, learning in the Latin American Caribbean region, inequality, uh, also in income and light of lifetime opportunities that for many have been lost, where many have fallen behind in a new world of increased uncertainty. So this is why tackling vaccine hesitancy matters so much. And last November, I launched a joint proposal with several ministers of health, including some present today from the region and several UN colleagues, it combined the efforts of five UN agencies, PAHO, UNICEF, UNDP, UN Women, and ITU, to support countries across the Eastern Caribbean to reduce vaccine hesitancy and increase vaccine uptake through six pillars of work. So allow me just to, to remind those six pillars. Uh, it uh, included research and policy options, uh, work on behavioral change strategies, risk communication and advocacy, strengthening COVID vaccines rollout, also working on vaccines motivation and of course, monitoring and evaluation. So we're now working with government to roll out the work plans, drawing on the comparative advantages of various UN agencies as is illustrated today with UNICEF. And I actually recall from that launch, for example, when Minister Steele of Grenada, alongside with Minister Baron Nesbitt of St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, were underlining the rise of conspiracy, conspiracy theory uh, using social media and highlighting the usefulness of such studies to effectively counter these uh, campaigns. So under the research and policy options pillar of this joint endeavor, the study today provides a solid evidence informed foundation for effective recommendations and to uh, help country to develop solutions. I must say that including well over 5,000 respondents from across the six countries in the, in, in, in the Eastern Caribbean, the study is informed by a wide range of opinions. And when it comes to vaccine hesitancies, what respondents are telling us is that they don't believe the vaccines are safe enough and they don't know what is in them. A quarter of the respondents feel this way. 
almost as many believe simply that they are exercising their choice not to get the job or are unsure of the long-term eff side effects. Despite this, the study shows that unvaccinated respondents can be persuaded to vaccinate. And this is the positive part of it. Half of them say they might be persuaded with access to more and better medical information. Over 40% want to know more about side effects and efficacy. 30% want information on the impact of vaccine on sexual or reproductive health and the ability to have children. So these are all rich things to explore. Also very important, uh, importantly tells us about the profile of those individuals opposed to getting vaccines. And that should clearly help to better target communications campaign and reach out better to these segment, segments of the population. So conclusion, I, I hope that by the end of the, this launch, we'll have a much better grasp of the true extent and nature of vaccine hesitancy and also look forward to further this coalition to promote vital vaccine taker. Thank you very much again for your presence today. Thank you, Mr. Trebuk. So long before COVID-19 pandemic, UNICEF globally has been supporting countries to not only acquire vaccines, but also to do public education around COVID-19, around vaccines. Um, and as I said, COVID-19 was no exception. For UNICEF, we are very concerned about the impact that COVID-19 has had on children. And for this reason, this is why we are extremely concerned about vaccine hesitancy. At this point, I would like to invite Dr. Aloy Kamaragi to present remarks on behalf of UNICEF. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. I think the protocol has been very well established by both the moderator and Mr. DJ Trebuk, the United Nations Resident Coordinator of Barbados and OECS. Uh, Honorable Ministers, uh, Deputy Chief uh, of Mission, U.S. Uh, Embassy, and uh, Mr. Didier Trebuk, UN Resident Coordinator, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin with uh, a story of Maria. Maria is a mother to nine-year-old Kyle. She is a working single parent and coping alone. When school is online, she still has to go to work. She sometimes has no choice but to leave her young child by himself all day, hoping but not really knowing that he will be safe. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a dilemma that many Caribbean parents are facing. Similar scenarios are being played out across the world. Different names, different faces, same issues. You may ask yourself, what this has to do with COVID-19 and with uh, vaccine hesitancy. The fact is many of our children have become at risk of abuse and neglect because of situations caused by COVID-19. As we've heard, education has been severely affected with hundreds of in-person school days lost. And online classes have not been a good substitute for many students. In a recent Eastern Caribbean EU report poll, one third of students, one third, I say, said they were not accessing online education regularly. And for those who were getting online, almost half, 46% to be precise, said they didn't find online education to be an effective way of learning, half of them. The good news is that we know what to do to make things better for the Marias and the Kyles of the Caribbean. One of the ways 
is to get vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccines. Science has shown us that as more persons are vaccinated against the virus, this reduces its ability to mutate as virus circulation decreases. However, we also know that almost one year into having vaccine accessibility, people are still hesitant about taking them and we need to understand why. It is for this reason that UNICEF with funding from USA commissioned this study in Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the Grenadines and the Trinidad and Tobago. These are the countries that UNICEF have been supporting to address COVID-19 with funding received from various donors. We have also engaged a company to do media monitoring to help us understand this very dynamic phenomenon. It is critical that countries' strategies and interventions to address this issue should be continuously influenced by data so that they can be evidenced inform informed in order to be effective. The study is important because it provides a profile of the persons who are hesitant about taking the vaccine. It examines why they think this way and allows them to tell us what could possibly change their minds. It looks at how people feel about vaccinating their children and what would persuade them to do it. For policymakers, it provides information about how, it, how the population feels about vaccine man mandates. It shows us that different countries have different vaccine hesitancy factors and we need to respond accordingly. No one size fits all. I urge all ministries of health and We're unable to hear, you've gone mute. We owe it to the Marias and Kais of our region. To end my remarks, I would like on behalf of UNICEF Eastern and Southern Caribbean to thank USAID for the financial contribution provided to our institution to support countries in their implementation of COVID-19 national plans. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kamaragi. As Dr. Kamaragi would have indicated and you would have heard throughout that USAID is a key partner with UN agencies in the fight against COVID-19. The ambassador was slated to be here, but she could not, but she's going to be ably represented by the Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. David Sneer. And at this point, I would like to invite him to give a few welcome remarks on behalf of the U.S. Embassy. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, protocol being established, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my Sincere pleasure to be with you this morning for the results of the launch of the recently concluded vaccine hesitancy survey. From the start of the pandemic, the United States government and people have stood with the governments across the Caribbean to offer technical and logistical assistance. Through USAID, the government and people of the United States have providing funding to various 
implementing partners, including UNICEF and PAHO, to end the pandemic and mitigate its devastating impact on people and societies. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the United Nations team for their collaboration and coordination with us on those efforts. Just last December, the United States delivered over 318,000 doses of Pfizer vaccine throughout the Eastern Caribbean via COVAX and through our bilateral mechanism. We've donated six field hospitals to countries across the Eastern Caribbean, and I will be traveling with the ambassador to St. Lucia next week to mark the donation of yet another field hospital there. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States is deeply committed to assisting the Caribbean and we are putting that commitment into action. Since May 2020, the United States government through USAID has supported the Eastern Caribbean region, the Bahamas, Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago with $7.5 million of assistance, of which 2.5 million came from the American Rescue Plan for Vaccine Readiness. This assistance provides support for the operational costs of COVID-19 vaccination campaigns, equipment procurement, laboratory detection, as well as outreach activities to reduce vaccine hesitancy, the theme of today. This also includes vaccine hesitancy surveys. Vaccine hesitancy is a public health concern, has not gone unnoticed to here at the U.S. Embassy, and we have experienced it personally here. In a late 2021, U.S. Embassy Bridgetown hosted a Facebook Live event to combat COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy inviting the people of Barbados and the Caribbean to ask questions of respected public health professionals. What we learned correlates closely to the data gathered from the vaccine hesitancy survey today, which in the Caribbean region, as you know, is mainly rooted in individual concerns about the safety of the vaccines, includes misconceptions and misinformation about the secondary effects of the vaccines. Fighting this pandemic will take significant resources and an urgent collective effort among governments, civil society, the private sector, multilateral organizations, and international partners. A coordinated approach like the one we're taking is critical up to a, an equitable uptake throughout the region and to muster the speed needed to get ahead of concerns that are driven by an unvaccinated population. In par partnership with governments and stakeholders the United States is committed to assisting Caribbean countries to overcome vaccine hesitancy. We are proud to work with our partners gathered here today to achieve this goal. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sneer. I understand you have to leave at this point for another commitment. So thank you for being here and gracing us with your presence. Thank you very much. So and ladies and gentlemen, Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the primary reason for us being here is to launch the findings of the research and no better person to do that than the director of cadres, Mr. Peter Wickham. And Mr. Wickham, I invite you at this point for you to share the findings of this study with us. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, uh, with protocol having been so eloquently observed. I can uh, move directly into the presentation um, and I'll start by sharing the screen so that we can have a sense of what is been presented. Uh, I want to say, of course, that I am grateful to UNICEF. I'm happy that we were able to partner with them in this exercise, which is certainly a very important part of us understanding what is, as we've just heard, one of the major risks to the development of children across the region. So for that reason, CADRIS is happy to be a participant in this exercise and to have been able to do some research, which certainly would not have been done uh, previously. The presentation today will focus largely on the national conclusions and uh, we have presented some data in relation to localized situations, but I will gloss over these in the interest of time. Uh, the report, as I understand it, is available to you so you can look uh, more heavily into the uh, individual islands or individual country observations. Uh, the study was conducted during October and November 2021. 
and the objectives, you, you understand. We looked at the situation in Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, and Trinidad and Tobago. The uh, stratification was done to ensure that we had some representation of children, oh, sorry, of people with children, persons with children, and we were telling interviewers, or we told interviewers that the persons that they interviewed, in addition to satisfying uh, certain sex and age considerations, also 40% of respondents should have been parents. Uh, and in instances where persons were not parents, we asked them to respond to child-related questions as though they were parents and what they would do in that instance. So that is to ensure that we have a, a basically a good representation that satisfies the uh, demands naturally of UNICEF, which is a primary client in this regard. The vaccine hesitancy index, which is presented here, is probably one of the more important uh, findings. And this one was uh, a data, we could call it a data manipulation, where we collected data and we also combined this with national data. So one of the demands of UNICEF was that we present uh, an index that would allow them to track hesitancy uh, on a scale from one to 10. So we agreed on a formula which we applied across the board, uh, which includes the percentage of persons who are not vaccinated, which came from national data, uh, persons that were eligible but unvaccinated based on survey data, and the percentage of unvaccinated persons who answered negatively to the question when we asked them, uh, I would be persuaded to change my mind if I was given more scientific or medical information. These were three critical data sets from our perspective, and we took the averages, multiplied them by 10 to generate an index on a scale ranging from one to 10, with one being the least hesitant, 10 being the most hesitant. Uh, UNICEF set an objective of the uh, hesitancy level of three, and, and the idea is that we should move or we should aim to bring our hesitancy level down to three in all instances. Uh, so you can see that of all the countries that we have surveyed, uh, Barbados is closest to three. However, even Barbados is not yet at three. Uh, of course, the Vincent and the Grenadines is, is the highest uh, away, farthest away from three, and the others are somewhere in between. So this will be a tool that we will use to track the uh, levels as we proceed. I'm going to skip this slide on vaccine level, vaccination levels, largely because this is information which would already be available to you uh, in relation to the actual country data that you would have access to. Um, the profile of unvaccinated persons is another key piece of information. And what we did here was that we found persons who were not vaccinated and we pulled specific demographic data and used that to help us understand what those persons looked like so that we can have a clear picture of the persons to whom we need to speak in terms of getting them vaccinated. Uh, we found uh, some pretty critical information. The first one is that these persons tended to be younger and presumably less concerned about the risk of being unvaccinated. Uh, persons who were not vaccinated were not working, uh, but either voluntarily or otherwise, uh, but there was uh, no need for them to enter an institu institutionalized environment, which clearly creates a disinclination to vaccinate. Now, when I say that, I, I should stress that a person who is not working in an institutionalized environment may be working at home. And I, I don't want to demean the role of the uh, persons uh, that stay at home or work from home, or alternatively, <laughs> persons for whom uh, housework is, is their, their primary employment. Uh, we, we appreciate that that is also employment. Uh, however, the point is that in situations where persons work in that type of environment, there's less of an inclination for them to vaccinate. Uh, we also found that persons who are uh, opposed to taking the vaccine invariably are also opposed to the government of the day, either on a personal or a general sense. This is, of course, a controversial issue, and I should stress that we did not include questions on support or opposition to government in the UNICEF survey. Uh, this is data that was garnered uh, elsewhere uh, in another survey done by Cadris, and I sought permission to include it since we appreciate that even though we are not seeking to interrogate these types of issues in the UNICEF survey, clearly it is one of the major factors because we found a significant proportion of persons who were hesitant. Uh, were also in opposition to the government of the day in all of the individual countries that we surveyed. 
Uh, the third one is uh, the education level. Um, in the Caribbean, compulsory education usually ends at secondary school. And we found that invariably persons who were hesitant uh, had just that compulsory education. So implicitly, persons who were educated to a higher level, uh, generally speaking, tended to be more likely to become vaccinated. And then the final one is that to justify the unvaccination status, invariably persons who were in this category said, I'm not vaccinated by choice. Um, or alternatively, I choose not to vaccinate due to the lack of trust in the vaccines, which is consistent with what you were hearing from the others. So we have profiles for all of the individual countries, which I'll move through uh, very quickly. And you can see uh, if we use Barbados as an example, uh, the majority in the red bars indicate uh, the majority of persons that are in each category. And we can see younger, male here, uh, and also the fact that we were educated at secondary level. And, and the trust issue in relation to the vaccine. Barbados was done twice, as I indicated. Uh, so we have the, the political question here. Uh, this is not a UNICEF data, of course, um, but it's borrowed. And this is the uh, concern that was being expressed. Um, we did, of course, Dominica, and they're all, all here. Um, the full report has the details that can be made available to you at a subsequent time. When we look at the reasons for being apathetic or hesitant towards the vaccine, and this section deals with that, uh, even though the survey was not designed to disaggregate these two issues, what we did, however, based on what information was available to us is that we pulled it together and we can see that persons who are vaccine apathetic were initially hesitant, but became vaccinated. And we have labeled persons who are vaccine hesitant as being unvaccinated and unwilling to vaccinate. So we have apathy, uh, which is persons who were initially hesitant, but decided to do it. And then finally, and then secondly, persons who were uh, vaccine hesitant uh, and have been unvaccinated and are still uh, willing to vaccinate. Uh, when we look at the main reasons comparatively in relation to the two, we can see that the higher numbers of the persons who are apathetic were, uh, didn't trust the vaccines, even though there's a statistically insignificant difference between the two. Uh, and then in relation to concern about side effects, the apathetic were more concerned about that than the hesitant. And then of course the hesitant, uh, they, they choose to exercise that choice. So what we can see really is that it, it was only with regard to the uh, long-term side effects, the apathetic were slightly more concerned uh, and you can see a hardening of opinion in relation to choice and, and, and trust. Um, there is a belief, I think, in most of the islands that these are issues that we can change by way of public information. Uh, and also convincing people. Uh, I have my own views on whether or not that will work, but nonetheless, I, I leave that to the communication specialists. But it is clear to me that we have a core of persons around 20% or so that uh, believe that they're exercising a choice, that it is theirs to exercise. And those persons are, are probably not going to move significantly in that regard. This is the country data in relation to apathy and hesitancy. That's available. The vaccination of children. Next section that we want to look at, and in this regard, the vaccination of children, we ask people about their willingness to vaccinate children. And what we found is that respondents, uh, generally speaking, were comfortable with vaccinating children that were older. Right? Um, overall, the uh, post-secondary and tertiary had the highest level of persons who were willing to vaccinate their children. Uh, and then at uh, secondary school, it was slightly lower. In primary school, the majority didn't, and pre-primary, certainly, certainly not. So the, the feeling is that people are willing to vaccinate older children. Uh, the country data supports that with, with one exception, two exceptions in Grenada and um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The major reasons for hesitancy regarding children, uh, we have two clear issues emerging. One is that people feel that they're too young. And then, of course, we have the choice issue that presents itself. But by and large, the, the feeling is that children are too young. And this is the reason why they cannot be vaccinated. On the flip side, we have uh, issues relating to why persons decided to vaccinate their children. And this was in instances where persons uh, had children who they were hesitant to vaccinate and thereafter decided to vaccinate. 
And you can see the two key pieces of information is that they did more research on a personal level. And then secondly, they spoke to the doctor or pediatrician and that seemed to work in many instances. The percentages in this regard are low, largely because uh, the majority of uh, persons who were in the survey, and this was a question that was asked certainly to uh, persons who decided to vaccinate the children. There is not a, uh, there were not a, there's not a huge penetration of that in the Caribbean already. So it's difficult for persons to answer that question unless they're actually in a situation where they have had the option to vaccinate their children. The views and opinions of vaccinated persons, and in this survey, we separated persons who were vaccinated from persons who were unvaccinated. What you had before with general information of persons across the board. In this instance, uh, where persons were actually vaccinated, uh, we were able to gain some information. So if they were originally uh, hesitant, um, we asked them why, and they indicated that there were trust issues and also the uncertainty about the long-term side effects, which is consistent with information that you would have seen before. They changed their mind because of research or speaking to the doctor, again, consistent with information that you would have seen before. Uh, the role of medical personnel and personal research in that regard. Uh, personalities, and these were used in many of the islands to convey information, and the personalities were both uh, local and international. Uh, people found them helpful somewhat in, in most instances. Uh, a minority of persons found those personalities unhelpful. And then when we asked them about support for vaccine mandates, mandates for vaccinated persons, uh, what we can see here is that generally uh, vaccinated persons support the imposition of mandates with respect to all of the categories identified with the exception of uh, school children. These are, of course, persons who are already vaccinated and they are generally comfortable with the mandates in all instances, with the exception of uh, children who are at primary school. But as I said, these are persons who already have been vaccinated. Let me move to the views and opinions of unvaccinated persons, which are the core of what we are interested in understanding. Um, we ask them the main reason why they're not vaccinated, trust and choice are the two that emerged. If their views have changed over time, 64% uh, have said uh, they still are not going to take the vaccination. And this is uh, a trend that we've seen across the board among persons who are unvaccinated that 64% of them are saying, or they're about to say that they're still not gonna take it over time. And there's really not a lot that you can do to encourage them to do so. The uh, sources that help them decide not to take the vaccine, and we see here social media, and then personal internet research, uh, which in many instances is one and the same. But there is uh, not a high level of uh, influence coming from, for example, government and official sources. Uh, private and medical sources is also relatively low. Um, so we can say uh, close to 50% of people who decide not to take the vaccine have been helped to do so by social media and personal internet research as distinct from uh, official government sources that many people have complained. Uh, many of these people have complained are, are biased towards a particular view. Um, information that could help them take the vaccine. Um, they've asked if information on side effects and efficacy can be presented. Uh, and then, you know, to a lesser extent, numbers of persons who are uh, sick and dying, if they heard that, that might shock some people. And then subsequently, but then uh, the other one would be the different types of vaccines available. Uh, as I indicated, I have my own reservations about the extent to which um, this kind of information can actually work to help people to take the vaccines. But nonetheless, this is what they report, having said that if they heard more information, uh, that this would be the position. But this data has to be contrasted with the other data or compared uh, that I put two slides back where persons said, you know, 64% said that they're not willing to, to consider it under any circumstances. Um, these persons who are unvaccinated also found the personalities helpful. Uh, however, a similar number found the personalities um, unhelpful and, and distracting. So uh, it's interesting that in this instance, uh, many people found the personalities uh, unhelpful and uh, largely because the personalities appear to be sending the message of a vaccination. My alarm is indicating that I'm out of time. I will just press on quickly to uh, give you the remaining information. 
consultation with doctors um, is shocking, actually, that um, most of the persons who are unvaccinated, um, close to, to two thirds of those persons did not consult with the doctor before making a decision. Uh, and only 17% uh, of them did consult with a doctor. And those numbers are consistent across the region. Trinidad and Tobago has the highest, which is probably 20%. But generally speaking, um, before making a major decision like this, uh, most people uh, do not consult with a doctor. And then we have a 20% that is saying that medical information was irrelevant. And that could be as it pertains to persons who believe themselves not to be eligible for one reason or another. Uh, the decision not to vaccinate was based on other factors. Um, there were three that we thought were interesting and we asked specifically, you know, was this person able to influence you? So we asked about family and friends, we asked about social media, and we asked about religious leaders because we wondered whether those specific um, influences were of any uh, significance. And what we found was that among the three, social media was the only one that had what we could consider a significant influence among 40% of persons. Um, the advice of family or friends was around 25% or a quarter. Um, and religious leaders, interestingly enough, appeared not to have a tremendous effect on persons' views in relation to this issue. And I should note that the major religions in the Caribbean, most of the major religions in the Caribbean have taken um, pretty progressive positions in relation to vaccination. So it would have been difficult for large numbers of people to use that as a basis. Um, factors that could change your mind regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we can see here that the medical information is, is identified as, as being one. Um, again, my doubts. The requirement to travel overseas is, is high, uh, 39%, and the requirement to maintain a job is also high. So if you have a third of persons uh, in terms of traveling, a third of persons in terms of maintaining a job, um, and then, of course, a third of persons being concerned about individuals sick, sick or dying. I think that the, the, the role of the institutional um, environment is important here. And as we made the point in the profile, that it, it helps us to advance an argument that if persons felt that they had no option but to get vaccinated to work or to travel uh, or for whatever other reason, then it is entirely possible that you can uh, gain some support that way. And I think this is one of the reasons, or not think, this is one of the reasons why I've raised uh, concerns about the fact that so many younger people are not being vaccinated because these are the ones more likely not to be working or alternatively to not be working in environments where they're structured. And for this reason, unless you create environments that encourage them to, to move in the direction of vaccination, um, they, they, will, they will see no reason why they need to do this. Uh, apart from vaccinations, the other options available, uh, people are inclined to better social distancing and more hand washing. Um, this is the, the two options that people have uh, pursued. Uh, herd immunity, um, the idea that COVID is a hoax, and then comprehensive lockdowns are, are not particularly popular, but um, certainly more hand washing and better social distancing seems to be what people are more inclined towards. Um, vaccine mandates, and remember this is among the unvaccinated persons, would you support vaccine mandates in respect of uh, any of these categories? And you're giving your frontline workers, public servants, arriving passengers, uh, workers in various industries. The only one that receives close to half of support is uh, frontline, sorry, is, is arriving passengers. And unvaccinated persons here again, so it's stressed, um, are saying that they would support mandates respect, in respect to arriving passengers but they are uncomfortable with mandates in any other uh, of the other regard. You have probably uh, one third in terms of medical workers, uh, one third in terms of workers in the hotel industry, and, and a third, close to a third in terms of taxis and bus drivers. But uh, low levels in terms of schools, and, and certainly in prim primary schools, very low levels, and then, excuse me, low levels in terms of public service. <clears throat> uh, the Final uh, slide in terms of the major observations and concerns, and this is what we have more or less agreed we would want to, to leave with you um, as a summary statement. And the, the fact that the survey, it provides a new detail, which is the profile of unvaccinated people. And uh, these tend to be young persons, uh, unemployed, not working in the formal sector and have a secondary level education. Uh, the main reason they give for not being vaccinated is they're not trusting the vaccines. They think they've been developed quickly and they don't know what is in them. 
And the second reason is that they think that it is a choice and it's a choice that they have chosen not to make. The survey, however, provides insight into what would make unvaccinated people change their minds. And one significant reason uh, is in relation to the ability to keep a job. So de facto mandates, if you aren't vaccinated, you can't go here. And, and this would be a, an effective, uh, one could say, um, inducement for persons to become vaccinated, uh, specifically um, for younger people, the ability to go to social events uh, could very well be used as a way to encourage persons in those environments to get vaccinated. Um, a lot of centers are respondents saying that they want more and better exposure to medical and scientific information, more specifically on side effects and efficacy, uh, and specifically how it can affect their sexual health and ability to have children. Um, this is something that we've heard a lot uh, in slightly less formal environments, but certainly something that the medical professionals can continue to speak to, uh, notwithstanding the fact that you know, there's still the hardcore of persons that are still not, not moving in that regard. Um, we've been given so much information on the first of these, which is the, uh, the information uh, that's been disseminated. Uh, clearly, it's not getting through. We need to ask through. We need to ask ourselves, how can we change these uh, conditions where persons are claiming they need more information? There is so much information available uh, in various forums. But yet still people are determined and saying that this is not um, the need, they need information which is available and they're not taking that information. Uh, people seem much less inclined to have their children vaccinated. Uh, those who've overcome initial hesitancy cite advice from their personal doctor or pediatrician in their own research. We need to find ways of getting more and better information to parents regarding the vaccination of children. And I should stress that the vaccination of children is relatively commonplace uh, for entry into schools. The, the problem is that we seem to have a divide between the traditional vaccination for measles, mumps, rubella, polio, et cetera, and vaccination in relation to COVID. The other point is that not everything will work everywhere. Uh, for example, several countries' information about uh, death and sickness would not make a difference, uh, and in several countries it will, and this is not the case for others. So this is something that we need to focus on. And then finally, uh, we need to be realistic. There's a hard core of people, more than 60% of the unvaccinated who will say they will not change. 20% report that they have become more inclined to do it. So do we focus on the 20% or alternatively, do we look at the 60% and ask ourselves, what can we do to bring this hardcore of persons around? So uh, gentlemen and ladies, uh, thank you for your time. Sorry that I took you know, more than I was supposed to, uh, but I look forward to uh, comments and criticisms or, or raised, uh, you know, issues that we need further information on as we continue to pursue this avenue. And again, I want to thank you, Seth, for giving us the opportunity to deal with this important developmental issue in the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Peter, for sharing the findings of the study. So we've heard the study's instructive findings and we recognize too that governments are committed to addressing this issue in 2022 and beyond. We have four ministers here, but I would like to invite two of the ministers present to share their perspectives. Um, they would have been shown their country reports. And I would like to first invite the most honorable Mr. Jeffrey Bostick, Minister of Health and Wellness from Barbados. And then he'll be followed by the Minister of Health, the honorable Terence Diaz Singh. In Trinidad and Tobago. Minister Bostic, over to you. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'll just say good morning, everyone. Um, about just over two years ago, we had a concern with a family from the United Kingdom that were displaying symptoms which were flagged by a medical facility to be possibly measles. And it was in preparing to deal with that should that had become a reality that I recognize as Minister of Health that we had fallen in relation to the, our measles program and the, the, the numbers really were not where they were supposed to be. And that raised a red flag and then came the pandemic. And uh, during and throughout this pandemic, we saw exactly what the impact of vaccine hesitancy would have on our entire program. And we really 
are very, very happy and appreciative of the efforts on the part of USA, UNICEF, and all those responsible for doing this very, very important work and for making this intervention, especially at this time. The statistics in relation to Barbados, um, I have to say really are consistent with what we are seeing on the ground, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And especially in relation to our primary and secondary school age children who have been impacted significantly by the pandemic in relation to their school program and their social development. And this obviously is a challenge that we are still facing. The, the stats are not where they ought to be at this point in time. And this has some implications for us going forward in relation to being able to get back to face-to-face -face classes. So even though we really are not surprised by the, the findings of um, by cadres in relation to what is happening here on the ground, we are really, really very happy at the recommendations made as to how we can deal with this problem. And for me, that is perhaps the most important thing because especially as we try to get those numbers up with our school children, um, there are some very, very good recommendations that I'm sure that we will implement in order to try to improve the situation. But there's life during COVID and there will be life beyond COVID. And as much as this is important for us in our fight against COVID, it has even greater implications to my mind in relation to the other side of life. Because apart from COVID, our immunization schedule contains about 14 antigens with, against other diseases. And between 2011 and 2019, our stats would have been in the 90s for the most part, 90% update, except for the MMR2. And um, what we are see, have seen in the last two years, really, we're right now down into the 70s. And although some of this is COVID related, we have to be very, very, very careful that there's not a domino effect in relation to our programs going forward outside of COVID. So this is very, very instructive indeed. And that is why for me, it is even more important. So I say thank you very, very much on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Barbados. It is useful information, very good guidance, and we look forward to implementing as many of the recommendations as we possibly can. Thank you for a very good job and a very good intervention. Thank you, Minister Mosse, Minister Diaz Singh, Honorable Diaz Singh, I invite you now to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning to all, and I stand on the protocols already established. I want to begin where Peter left off, when Peter asked for comments and criticisms. Peter, you will get comments from me, but you will get absolutely no criticism. What you will get from me is a shower of thanks and praise uh, for the work that you have presented this morning. Before I delve into the response of the study, I want to express my thanks to UNICEF, cadres, and everyone who participated in this study. It is my strong opinion that this study came at the opportune time for the region and the world as we experience decreasing levels of vaccination. Initially, as with most countries worldwide, Trinidad and Tobago experienced a steady rise in the number of completed vaccinations. The diffusion of innovation theory tells us that you have different groups of populations that adopt new technologies, new thinking, whether it's cell phone, internet banking, and vaccines. At Trinidad and Tobago, we are currently at 48% fully vaccinated. That means we have already vaccinated the innovators, the early adopters, and the early majority. What we are after now, and which this study will help us, is that late majority. And I really don't know what we will do with the laggards in society, those who are just not going to get vaccinated and probably will not change their minds. 
I am particularly pleased at the country profile put out, which shows and which validates our own thinking here, that the majority of persons in Trinidad and Tobago will be those with a secondary level education that has been validated by this report. And most importantly, we are the world in that unstructured, non-institutional environment. And this report now will now feed in to our behavior change management program, which we uh, engaged the, minister, uh, the University of the West Indies again in December of last year under the Faculty of Social Sciences to come up with a behavior change modification process. So the service report on the profile of the unvaccinated in Trinidad and Tobago will certainly help us to come up with a more focused uh, policy intervention communication strategy using the media platforms that those individuals use, which is mainly social media. So coming out of that, I hope that the scale from one to 10, where we want one to be the most perfect and 10, uh, the least perfect, where we are at 4.4, I am hoping to use this report and Peter, as I said, you will get no criticisms from me. You will just get praise and thanks. And that praise and thanks and the information you have presented will help us, I am sure, in the coming months to craft the necessary communication strategies, use the appropriate communications platforms, and this new body of knowledge, which USAID has graciously funded together with UNICEF, will help us move to the data to be from its current 4.4 to as close as possible as three, as humanly possible. As we enter into the third year of this pandemic, this study is timely, this study is important, and I want to throw all 180 pounds of my weight behind it. Thank you and good morning. Thank you both Minister Dale Singh and Minister Bostic for your remarks and for the other ministers who were present as Dr. Alois would have said earlier, we want to assure you that UNICEF will be here to support you as you develop those behavior change interventions and strategies and using the report to be evidence informed as we develop more targeted interventions. So at this point, I would like to invite questions from any media houses that are present. Um, the reports are on the UNICEF website. And if you don't have a copy of them, you want to reach out to us directly, you can do that. But um, if there are any questions, please identify yourself. We allow um, about three questions because you know we're running short on time. Um, but as I said, the report is there. You can always reach out to us. So if there are any questions, please identify yourself and you can use the opportunity at this time to raise them with any members of the persons who spoke, or Mr. Vickham. Um, I would like to ask a question. I'm looking for the hands to raise, uh, but I can't find it. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Benjamin Puertas um, from the Pan American Health Organization. So very briefly, first of all, the congratulations to the colleagues in uh, UNICEF. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, PAHO carried out um, a study on vaccine hesitancy in 14 countries in the Caribbean uh, last year in, um, from April to June, and uh, I'm going to share the report in the chat. Uh, and uh, I was very interested in the results uh, since um, uh, we in our study and we understand that almost 85% of the population is influenced by healthcare workers in their decision to, to get the vaccine or not. So um, in our study, we had a lot of uh, hesitancy among nurses, uh, about 34%. Uh, percent. This is a sample size of 1,200 physician nurses and other healthcare professionals. So when you mentioned about speaking to my doctor, uh, my question was, uh, what about the nurse? Because uh, doctors were only hesitancy in, hesitant in about 14, 15%. So what about if they ask a nurse that's going to be, a, they're going to influence in a much completely different way. So that's something we need to take into consideration. 
uh, but who's working very hard in, uh, especially with nurses, to to um, uh, through communication strategies uh, uh, to influence nurses and to. Uh, target that population in particular. We also got similar results in terms of um, age, uh, younger age groups of healthcare workers are more hesitant uh, com compared to older ones. And also we, we found differences even within <coughs> categories of doctors and nurses. So, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Bostic uh, knows very well that uh, the COSO, the Council of um, Human and Social Development, uh, as well as the other uh, the ministers of health, approved a policy brief uh, in last October, in which based on this um, analysis and one carried out by, um, by CARFA, um, we uh, presented and PAHO supported uh, CARICOM and the HRH Action Task Force to develop a policy brief to address vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers. And the first uh, policy action is to monitor and to monitor the, the um, drivers that um, uh, influence uh, vaccine acceptance among healthcare workers and mapping this um, situation. So what uh, UNICEF is doing is exactly that. We need to continue monitoring this situation and now we're preparing to, to do so as well. So again, our congratulations and um, Pajo is very willing to share that uh, information as we got. And I think uh, these uh, combined efforts could be even more important in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. And at this point, we really would like to also recognize the president, the presence of Dr. Gibre, who is the um, resident uh, director for Pajo. Any other Questions, any other comments? I don't see any hands. Yes, Joanne Paul. Uh, um, sorry, uh, Peter, did you want to respond before Ms. Paul spoke? Yeah, no, just a, just a quick response to, to thank Dr. Curtis for his comment and, and to acknowledge that certainly in relation to the number of the island, number of the Caribbean countries, the public health nurse is an important communicator in relation to these types of issues. So I, I do agree that we need to be a bit more broad in our brush than just looking at the information regarded from doctors, that nurses and particularly the public health nurses are, are important. So thank you for that, for, for making that point, because it, it does, does indicate that there's an area that we need to look outside of well, the broader definition of healthcare professional uh, to take into consideration nurses. So thank you. Okay. So, Joanne, Paul, um, I invite you at this time to make your comment. Sure, thanks for that. Um, Joanne Paul, specialist in pediatric emergency medicine from Trinidad and Tobago, and also with the Ministry of Health team here. My question to Peter, in terms of your social media aspect, where the unvax, it showed that they would respond more to social media. Um, could you, did you do any sub-analysis of what type really? Because um, we have a whole gamut, right? So are we saying IG, um, YouTube, do they specify a particular type or a personality frame? Any, any framework there that will give us some more focus in terms of our communication deep dive with social media? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a simple answer. The the details of the individual reports do give you some more information uh, in terms of favorite media, and uh, in many instances, we've disaggregated some of them. But the the reality is that the social media world is, is so vast that it, it was difficult to disaggregate all of them. But there is some some more detailed information in the Trinidad report that speaks to um, the preferred mode of communication. Uh, as distinct from what influenced them. And I think the preferred mode of communication uh, is a section that will, will probably help you tease it out a bit more. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, if there are none, I would like to invite Dr. Carlene Rabbits from the OECS to give the closing remarks. As I said before, the study, I saw the study has been put in the chat, the link, but the country report should be on our website as well. And we will send them directly to you, to, to your focal points in your ministries of health. Dr. Raditz?
Thank you very much um, for the opportunity um, to give these closing remarks. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I make note of the protocols that have been established, but I do want to take the moment to recognize the presence of our, um, the Ministers of Health, the Honorable Moses Jean-Baptiste, Minister, Ministry of Health and Wellness and Elderly Affairs of St. Lucia, Honorable Nicholas Steele, Minister of Health and Social Security of Grenada, um, Lieutenant um, Colonel, the Most Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, Minister of Health and Wellness, of Barbados and Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I'm honored to bring greetings to you on behalf of Dr. Dreyfus Jules, the Director General of the OECS Commission, on this important occasion and give a few closing remarks. Vaccines have been an important tool in our arsenal in the battle against COVID-19. And this survey has given us further insight into the understanding why some people have chosen to be vaccinated and why some persons have changed their minds along the way while others still lack confidence or have decided not to be vaccinated. The current increase of cases globally, regionally, and beginning in our individual countries is an opportunity for another reflection point. We have watched as other countries are showing strain on their health systems with increasing hospitalization, and we prepare for what will be our unique experience. This is a new variant, and like others before it, we will not intimately know how it will affect our populations, which have different vaccination rates than the countries to which we look to for experience. However, we do know that vaccinations protect our more vulnerable groups, including our older persons, persons with chronic diseases, and, um, person, and these persons have a propensity to hospitalization and to death. The current survey is a timely contribution to our current rally for everyone to be aware, to prepare, and to take all relevant measures. Recognizing the need for all hands on deck in light of the unprecedented increases in cases, the OECS convened an extraordinary virtual multi-sector meeting on the COVID-19 and the variant just this week to consider protocols, supplies, and health system capacities in light of the experiences already seen in other parts of the globe. As the launch of this survey closes, I want to make a call for all our countries, our region, to not allow the divisions that have complicated the focus on dealing with COVID-19 to distract us from the need to consistently do everything that we need to and are willing to, to protect the most vulnerable among us while keeping our economies running. I make an appeal here to the media represented, represented as you also have an extremely important role, which I know you take seriously and which is so important currently to expose persons um, in, a, in a, a palatable way to the medical and scientific information and general experiences around vaccine side effects and concerns. I also know the need to continue to educate the public on the importance of and efficacy of our general public health vaccines and even the history of our Caribbean region, which has led the world in the elimination of vaccine preventable diseases as has been highlighted by the Honorable Minister of Health from Barbados. I make note of the collaboration of agencies that went into this survey, including the role of USAID and the UN agencies who, are, who continue be, to be close partners to the OECS Commission as we continue to support OECS member states and to collaborate with our other um, regional partners and member states um, through our unique ability to pull together various sectors and regional collaborative responses in health, including our pooled procurement mechanisms. I want to end by saying every sector, public and private, every business, every community, every family, and every individual should be aware of, prepare for, and continue to take every appropriate action during this current wave, because together is the best way for us to face this challenge, minimize the fallout and continue to thrive.
I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raditz, for your rallying call and, of course, for your support. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this ceremony, and I want to thank all of you for your presence here. I want to thank everyone for making this possible, those who work behind the scenes. And as I said in the chat, if you need a copy of your country report, please email us at UNICEF and you can get a copy of the report or, like I said, or check our website where it is. The PAHO report, the link to it is also in the chat. You can also use that. But I pray that these um, studies, that they will be instructive in your interventions as you move forward to address COVID-19. Thank you very much for being here. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank you.